Welcome to the Usual Rejects Podcast. I'm Kirk Oskowski. As always, I'm here with... Devin Anderson. Hey, folks. And Greg Russ. Hello. And I have to say that uh, it took a very special moment to actually force my friends here onto a video call. For years now, as you all know, we've been attempting to uh, move to video. I keep complaining about it. And uh, Greg had no interest in it, nor did Devin. At Comic-Cons, I was able to film some things and put it on. But really, it took a special moment in my life. And that special moment is the moment when you can get to tell your friends, I told you so. Because in this moment, which you are all waiting for, because too much to my surprise, I'm going to be completely honest, the Flight of the Navigator episode became huge. The, the last episode that we had, which I, I have to admit, I hadn't seen the film until yeah. now. I told you so. I told you so, Kirk. Yeah. Um, Devin and I have been it, telling you for... Was it, bigger than the, was it bigger than the Lethal Weapon episode? Because that will give me a lot of happiness. I think it is, but if it's not <laughs> the episode we're filming right now, and we'll be releasing both on video, on Facebook and Instagram, and audio as usual, uh, I think that's going to top. I think this one right now that you're hearing is going to top all of that. Oh, because, man. Because... Uh, well, I think I, I think I need to toss it to you guys because it's a very special moment for you two, right? I mean, you should talk about what this movie means to you. Oh, for us? <laughs> <laughs> and that Surprise. right there. <laughs> <laughs> the Way to go, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and there goes the, uh, there goes the secret surprise is that we actually have um, the filmmaker of Life After the Navigator and... Joey Kramer himself joining us on this very special yeah! episode. And See, to, that, set, to, to set it up, Kirk, okay, you asked me what Flight of the Navigator means to me. Um, I, I, just, I did, and everyone just stared at me. Well, and then Joey, being the good actor that he is, hopped he in. Over, and said, yeah. Yes, and. See, I do a podcast with two people that you no, stare no, blankly at me. No, but, no, but, yeah. I, I, I'll answer the question. I, you know, I, I kind of set it up last time. We've been telling you to watch the film for years. Um, but as a kid, uh, it was the first film that actually I watched and thought, man, that really made me think. There was enough substance and depth to that movie that my young brain it rattled around for a while and the concept stuck with me. And I think that's why to this day, you know, that film compared to other films that were marketed towards children, because you could also argue that it's not just a, a kid's film, but marketed towards children was one of the first ones. Like, wow, I really like that compared to this other trash that I've been watching. <laughs> but that's what it means to me. And I think that's an important distinction to make because a lot of the times films are put out and they're just, here, watch this. It's mindless. Go with it. Leave us alone. Leave us parents alone for a little bit. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a good point uh my litmus test for how much a movie meant to me as a kid is always now as an adult calling up my mother and being like hey do you remember this movie so i actually called my mom about a week ago and i was like hey mom do you remember life you, not life life after the navigator do you remember flight of the navigator and my mom immediately was like oh yes i remember flight of the navigator and it was obviously it, it was that means that like it was the movie that was either on all the time or it was the movie that was like put this on and devin will shut up so hands down is obviously such a huge huge part of my life as a kid and that's why uh, when when today's episode was confirmed uh, honestly, like I, I've had to, I have to pinch myself. This is probably one of the greatest, greatest moments of my life. I'm so excited. And, and you got your special craft services sign out ready for it. Yeah, Such yeah. A I'm, big moment. I'm waiting for a, a craft services uh, PA to come in and hand me my scone at a good social distance. And and to pull Kirk back into this, just to tie him into the discussion <laughs> at hand, and to to wrap up what we were saying about the quality of the film. Kirk had never seen it until this advanced age. He watched it for the first time recently. And also, if you can go back to the last episode, he said, you guys were right. You were right. I don't know why I've waited this long to watch this. So there is value there for someone, you know, again, well into their adult life. Totally. But that's pretty, for so many of these movies you watch as a kid, you often have people who watch them as an adult for the very first time and it doesn't connect as much. Yeah, so for yeah. you to watch it as an adult and it's still have that impact that just goes to show how 
fabulous Flight of the Navigator is. It really is. Uh, I loved every minute of it, and I was so happy <laughs> to see it. And uh, I think uh, there was a bunch of movies that kind of came out at that time that if it had anything to do with aliens, better and, it not was, and it wasn't uh, E.T., which blew my little mind as a child. I just kind of didn't watch it because I just kept watching E.T. over and over again. Um, so to come on, come at this uh, now uh, and watch it, and it still so holds up uh, in such a great way. And I had no idea what it was about. Like it was, it, I'm, I was so grateful to Devin and Greg that they didn't even really tell me. And I went in completely fresh to watch this story of a child who got taken away from their family for eight years. I was like, oh, this is a really interesting way to handle this. Like, it really, uh, I really dug it. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, comes, it comes from an age uh, that you just, you don't see anymore in terms of, you know, script writing. Uh, and I, I, that's why I'm almost jealous of you that you got to see it at this age. It's like seeing a brand new movie, seeing, because we're, we're so used to remakes and redos and revamps these days to like, to, to find something that you know has been around for so long. It, it's like it's a, it's a gem. It's a it's a diamond in the rough to find something like this. No, uh, it's it's particularly touching because of the performances too. It's it works on every level. The, the special effects are excellent. Still, it all still holds up. I mean, and you see that it's the precursor for things like the T one thousand. You can see it immediately as soon as you watch the film, um, which I saw way before I should have. I think I saw Terminator two in theaters. So. Um, which you're talking about the, the special effects with the ship in Flight of the Navigator and the reflective surface and yeah. how that same, the same effects were applied to the Terminator 2. Yeah. Um, so we should probably introduce our special guests uh, yeah. directly because you've been hearing them already. Uh, we have Lisa. <laughs> we have, I we, heard we, Lisa chime in. I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be talking or not yet. I, I mean, only chimed in because you chimed in at the beginning. I was it's, following Sush. It is all good, my friends. Um, we're just so happy to have you here. This is Lisa Downs, who uh, directed and edited, um, and I want to talk about that too, uh, Life After the Navigator, which we did talk about in the last episode because we were excited to hear that this was coming. And then you Instagram messaged me because I guess she caught the hashtag or something. And I did, and I was excited that you had talked about it. So I messaged. And, and uh, of course, you heard Joey Kramer, the star of Flight of the Navigator himself. Hey. <laughs> hey. Yay. I'm so excited to be here. This is so fun. <laughs> I love this. You guys are great. I, I mean, you know, already I heard some really cool things, if I can just chat a little bit. But it, it's like the fact that, uh, that Greg, you were talking about that the movie kind of blown your mind as a kid. Um, I think I find it so cool because I that's a recurring theme that I hear from people that that um, it was the first movie that kind of opened their world up and they went, wow, like it, it, they just could relate to it on on all these personal levels like being separated or be feeling alone and then coming back home and things like that and then also just the the movie magic of it but the the scope of the imagination and everything that just really made people think and and feel at such a uh you know a, a instrumental age or something where you build those strong memories that can take you through life and pretty magical pretty special yeah the emotional part of the film hits perfectly um, but also it introduces relatively complex theories, presents them in a digestible way for, I don't know how old I was at the time when I saw it, seven or eight, but, you know, the time travel, the science fiction element to it. So it does, it brings all these things together, and I think that's probably why it's got a, it has a lasting impression in my brain. But, the, you know, the emotional element's an important thing. Uh, when you're a kid, you don't pick up on those things, I don't think, as much consciously watching a film. So they just hit you. It's like you're not too aware of your being and your feelings. But when it hits, you know. It has an impact, and you don't realize it until later in life. Like, yeah, it did. It was moving. Um, so I want to talk first a little bit about uh, Life After the Navigator, which is um, what we're here celebrating right now, is transitioning from Flight of the Navigator episode to Life After the Navigator. I am so amazingly impressed with this film as just a film on its own uh i i uh want to know your journey of 
falling in love with Flight of the Navigator that made you make this documentary about it? Well, thank you for such kind words because it's, you know, we've started to show people now. And so it's always very nerve wracking when the first rounds of feedback come back. So um, it, it's really been great that it's been received. And Joe has been seeing rough cuts and he hasn't quite seen the finished, finished version. We're having kind of a mini premiere on Sunday. So it'll be exciting to see how he feels about it. Um, but for me, I mean, mine's kind of the same story as... Um, as you guys, I, I watched it as a kid. I don't remember the first time I saw it, but it was just, I was probably young enough that I didn't have that ability to remember, like sitting down and watching TV. I just, it was part of my childhood. And I was, I think it was one of the first films that I had seen where the character was kind of someone that I could relate to at a similar age level, or, you know, you want to be friends with, David and you want to go on these adventures and I was obsessed with being abducted by aliens like I used to look at the clock because I had heard that time jumps if you were abducted so I would like look at the clock going did I just miss an hour could was that it am I you know and I thought I have quite like I grew up in Australia so I have a lot of freckles and I thought they were maybe star maps so I would like compare my arm to the sky in case like my, my arm matched and, you know, it was a sign and, you know, Max is going to come and get me. And I was so obs obsessed with it because you're not really conscious too. It's a movie. I, I kind of thought it was real, you know, so it was just, it was one of those films that have an impact on you. And so um, I had just finished the, the last, well, coming to the end of the last documentary I was doing and I was like, I want to do another life after film. What film do I love? Um, and then I sort of fly to the navigator and then I Googled and then at the time it was like kind of your reaction from your podcast when you read about what happened to Joe and where he was. Um, I was just amazed that I had no idea. I hadn't seen the headlines when they hit at the time. And so it was really just reading the Wikipedia page that I found out about what happened. Um, and then I tracked him down and we became pen pals when he was still inside and we met five months after he got out and it was just, I mean, it was the most amazing journey I've ever been on. It was, and cause you're seeing the transition too from the, the, the transition of recovery as well that we've been honored to witness. And it's just been so surreal. Like even meeting Joe the first time, seeing David's face when he, talked i was like this is too weird um and then obviously meeting cast and crew along the journey but it's just i've been so grateful that i can not only get to know joe but celebrate this film that i just think is so magical in so many ways so lisa just to try to get a time frame on this when you first reached out to joey how long ago was that how many years at this point uh september must have been about September 2017, I think, was when I first read, uh, or thereabouts. Yeah, it would have been it? actually probably six months before that, because I was released 2017. So it would have ah, been yes. spring, spring of 2017. Yes, because you, yeah, because I remember reading the sentence was two years less a day. And then I it was timed perfectly because it would take a week to get letters sent. So I knew that it, when I wrote a letter, you would write back straight away, which meant I knew what day you were probably writing the letter. And then I would be so excited, like the day that was two weeks to the day that then your letter without fail would arrive. And then I'd write back the same day. And so I think we had maybe a few weeks of that. And then, yeah, you got out September, 2017 and March, 2018, we first met in person and started filming. But before that we had sent Joe a camera to start self-documenting his feelings and thoughts. And so you see that in the film as well. So also just to set this up, I don't, you know, we mentioned it in the last episode um, and Joey, I'd like you to speak to it since, you know, it's your story. I don't want to misrepresent it, but obviously there's references of you being in prison at that point. And um, I don't know if, if you want to set that up a bit for anyone who's not aware of how all that went down. Right. So, Part of the, well, the, the way that Lisa and I got connected was um, 
basically because I had been arrested. And so there was this social media coverage of the child star, the Disney actor, you know, alleged bank robbery and seashells and, and, and things like that. So um, again, it's, it's a funny way that I look at it, that a negative turns into a positive. And, and that's really how um, my whole uh, kind of outlook and experience with with prison and jail and everything, especially this time, was was focused on turning that negative into a positive. So, um, yeah, I I mean, how far back to go? But um, I got into some trouble and I needed some some uh, some long term help and 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 uh, <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes it's hard to get uh, to get like long term treatment for um, addiction or um, and and a lot of that stems from mental health and and kind of antisocial behaviors and just like not knowing how to function in regular society. And so um, I knew about this uh, program that was in a correctional institution. And I thought, well, let's get myself arrested and put away for a couple of years so I can <laughs> I can actually get the help that I need. Um, it's a and, shame that, sorry to jump in, and no, that, no. I, I know this is maybe a path we don't want to go down too much, but, you know, the access to the help that you need required you to go to jail, which is ridiculous to me, that it's like it wasn't accessible to you otherwise. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Well, basically, I mean, I had to, I had kind of specific circumstances as well uh, that, that made it more difficult, but it is true that it's, uh, it's challenging um, say if if someone off the street wanted to get clean and sober, they couldn't just walk in somewhere. You've got to phone, sign up, get on a wait list, and then you got to phone every day for a week or two. And then once they let you, uh, once they say, okay, well you've committed enough by making these phone calls, now we'll let you come in. And uh, oh, but you can't. You have to be uh, sober for two days before you can come into the detox or come into the so there's all these kind of hoops that you have to jump through and I'm sorry but for someone who's in active addiction or homeless or, or just running from place to place uh, surviving those things can be extremely uh, challenging and hard and and from an outside perspective it can seem like oh they don't want to make the effort. They uh, they're just lazy. They're just drug addicts. They're just criminals or whatever. Um, and um, uh, it's that's part of what I hope that some people will see is that even every, a normal person can go from uh, can have their life flipped upside down um, pretty pretty easily. Yeah, the misconception that people can just stop. It's a shame that that exists. That there's not an understanding that it isn't that simple, and, and you know there is. Uh, people are starting to kind of you know lose the stigmas around uh, addiction or and mental health a lot of, uh, and and so start to understand that um, everything stems from trauma really. So uh, yeah, and and I think you talking about it like this and putting it out there in the film uh, that's being released, you know, that's a people say it's brave and they just. It is, and maybe that term's used too much, but it is a difficult thing, I'm sure, to talk about. Um, you know, you're vulnerable by putting it out there. So, you know, for doing that and being someone, we're talking about the film Flight of the Navigator and what it means to us. And, you know, at some point you become curious and you look up what happened to the people in the film and you see your story, but it's like you don't get the full story. I just see, you know, Joey Kramer goes to jail and like, oh, wow. And that's kind of the end of it. Except now we have this film that then gives more insight and opens up, you know, it pulls back the curtains a bit. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative that you did it. I well, do think was, it's a helpful thing. That was something that was really important to me as well, because we live in a world now that there's so much clickbait that people are so quick to judge a headline. It's like, Jerry, you know, former child star robbed a bank. Well, you know, there's the Disney system or another child star, you know, and it's, it's so easy to kind of judge someone on what you read that you forget that there's like a human behind the headline and that there's a reason how they got to that point that I hope this film kind of will make people think about. No, I, I mean, watching it, my, watching it myself, it def definitely did do that. Sorry, Kurt, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. I, I just, uh, I wanted to say that, you know, the balance that you struck of making one of the best making of documentaries I've seen as well as this personal story, which 
those two things are one, but it, it's, it's amazing that you find this balance of going back to the making of, as well as editing, because uh, I saw that you were the editor of this film as well. It's masterfully edited. Uh, it's Thank you. easily <laughs> one of the best making ofs I've seen on top of this incredibly uh, personal and vulnerable and open story. And I genuinely think that even if you're listening now and you haven't seen Flight of the Navigator, there is such incredible value and it's an excellent film just on its own merit of just watching the, the personal story on, a, on that documentary basis of seeing someone in recovery, um, the obstacles that it takes to go through that. And um, uh, I have to say that, you know, how much more could I possibly care about somebody than seeing Joey go through this? Like, I don't have this childhood connection but having watched, just watched it for the first time very recently, and then seeing you, and you're still you, you still look, you know, like there's no mistaking that that's you uh, growing up, you know? Um, and to, to see that, that, uh, you know, that, that struggle that you had to go through to get where you're at, I, I just, uh, I commend everybody involved in this. And I'm so grateful that it's so easy to talk about because I'm excited that <laughs> we put it out there and then I got handed this beautiful documentary because <laughs> it would have made a very difficult conversation if it wasn't but it really well thank you bottom of my heart is well the uh, the uh, sorry no no just what something that came up for me right there was that um about me sharing my story and 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 overcoming the obstacles that i have and something that i really um uh, want to share and express and 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 also that I hope that this and know that this documentary will help other people from all walks of life because we all have our challenges we all have our our stuff that we're getting through and getting over um, everybody's been through some sort of challenge or hurt or pain traumas in their lives and, and right um and because maybe addiction and, and stuff is a little more extreme on the, I don't know, social level, I think that uh, also that, but I've had people reach out who can relate um, because they're going through depression or anxiety or even just stress or, um, you know, uh, bullying, things like that. And, and so I think that all of these, um, just the, the message of of uh, of overcoming and and uh, and reaching out for help and being vulnerable and share and being able to share honestly, I think will help a lot of people and show them that it's it's okay to reach out and like for me it was it's really it's scary uh, to to put yourself out there right um, but then I get people like you and and others who just embrace the the vulnerability and they they show me that it's okay to be to be real and to um to share this and and so then i get more encouraged and then i share more and then it helps more and then it i share more and it's just this ripple effect or this you know this circle circle of of uh of goodness <laughs> <laughs> no at this point it just you're genuine you come off as genuine and i think people want authentic people at this point you know in, in a world where Everyone is trying to find their way, and I don't want to demonize anyone who maybe is presenting a version of, their, of themselves that isn't who they actually are out there because you just want to survive. People just want to survive and get through it as best as they can. But, you know, being open, vulnerable, authentic with it, it does go a long way. And I think that's, you know, we're talking about the emotion in the film itself that was relayed through the acting. You know, the emotions here, too. It's real at this point. It's not acting, but it's still there. It's, it's presented. And in a very effective way, because you're just sincere. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to um, touch on the the making of aspect of the film, because um, what was really interesting, because obviously when you are celebrating a film, you do want to have fans see the making of. Everyone loves like the tidbits and how things were made, and trying to blend that with the personal story. What was really interesting to watch unfold is it's still all connected. So you're talking to the cast and crew about not only their time on set, but then when they heard about the bank robbery and Randall trying to reach out and he was upset about it. And I had Mark Green, who was the prop master in Stone Fox, emailed me out of the blue and said, I've just seen the teaser for the documentary. I love Joey working with him. Can I be involved? What can I do? And so you see that 
you know, there's this whole human connection between the cast and crew more than just a making of. It's like, yes, we had a great time on the set. This is how we made it. But I'm really, you know, this is the reality of maybe a child actor and their experiences on set. And this is how I reconnected with Joe. And, you know, I used to hang out with Joe when he was little and, you know, my like Jonathan Sanger and you used to go around to his house and you were friends with his family. And so it really is this, this family that the making of and the personal story has connected itself anyway. And Lisa, when you, I have to turn on a light. Oh, sure thing. Um, so when you reached out to Joey for the first time, we've established that was the 2016, probably, uh, how do you approach it with him that you're wanting to make this, this documentary and what you want the content to be, or did you even know at that point, what direction you wanted to go? And did that form after you started talking to him? Um, well, I knew, I only knew of his story, what I read online and I had, I knew from doing the last documentary that you can't always believe what you read online. So it was like I had a little bit of knowledge. I knew the um, the sentence, the court that he was in. The, I found the court number. Um, I knew that it was two years less a day. And then through research, realizing that that's a correctional center and not a federal. So I knew he was in a correctional center. So I contacted British Columbia correctional centers. Um, and they said, if you have his full name and his birthday, you can send a message and then we can try and get it to him. We can't tell you what center he's in. So I, I just used the information I could find online and I wrote this letter, um, which I still have. I think Joe's got the handwritten one that I eventually ended up writing, but I, I sent a message saying I wanted to kind of talk about doing a documentary. And then his mum calls, who you see in the documentary, she's just amazing, Carolyn. Um, and no relation to Carolyn in, I thought maybe it was named after your mum, Joey, but Randall said it, it <laughs> no, wasn't. No. Um, so she called and said, oh, Joe would love to talk to you. He's having trouble with the phone, but um, can you call? And I remember like you see Netflix documentaries where they start going, do you accept a call from so-and-so <laughs> present? And so there was the voice message on my phone like that. Um, and, and then we just had a conversation and I just wrote this letter saying, look, this is what I want to do. It'd be really collaborative. We're independent. So it wouldn't be kind of an expose. Where are they now? You know, child star TMZ kind of headline piece. I wanted it to be the human story and a way for Joe to tell it how he wanted it to be told um, in a way that he was comfortable telling. And, you know, it, the, the good thing about doing a film like this is it's over a couple of years. So you get to know someone and they get to know you. And, um, mm -hmm. but that was, I think I just was like, I, as honest as you want it to be and very collaborative. And, you know, as soon as we can start filming, I would love to do this with you. And maybe people can learn from what you've learned and any message you want to get out. Um, and, pretty receptive straight away like I remember I think we were writing in our letters saying you know let's use your music in the film and maybe you can do a right. song about this stage in your life and song about this stage in your life and so it was quite fun to start through letters discussing what maybe we could do with the documentary and um, then it just kind of grew from there but I had no idea how it would end up you know I think I said in another interview Joe that um you don't know how it's going to end so even when we met Joe for the first time like you could see this amazing person and you know there was such a sadness to you um but after we interviewed you I was like I don't you know this could go either way at the end of the documentary it could be a, the ending that we all want but it could also be the ending that we don't want so yeah. it was like let's just film and see what happens you know so it was a really interesting journey to take is that something you worry about if it's the ending you don't want you're forming a relationship with joey as this goes on and you know if it does get to that point are there qualms about making that the ending of the of the film or mm, it, a story it was, to tell so you just do that it was never about the film um it was we've got to know this person. And I think we like myself and Joey and Ash, who you see in kind of the background, a lot like petrol pumps and you know, um, he, we all instantly connected, I think. So it was more, you 
even after the first day, I was like, I don't want this for his sake to be the ending that we don't want. Like he's such a beautiful person that you just want him. Like you want the very best for him the, the minute you talk to him. So it was never about the film. Like we would have just documented what had happened. And if there was a lesson to come out of the other road, then, you know, that would have been what it was, but What's it was so never about the film. For, for me is that I, we just, this, this subject came up like, for example, okay, what if we started filming the documentary and then I relapsed and, and went off and started, right? And ended up back in jail again, because that's a very real possibility. Um, it's, uh, it's been a, a recurring theme before, right? I'd, I'd been to jail before and just kind of got out and did well for a while and then would just kind of slip back in. And unfortunately, again, it's one of those things where it's really easy to just get in that cycle of criminal behavior and, and it's, you go and, uh, so, but I'd never actually thought about that until just, just now, the whole time I never thought, uh, that uh, that I wasn't going to succeed, and um, not in an ego way or a um, conceited way. I just uh, this time was so different. I really just knew that uh, that I was done. I was I was done with that life. I mean, my daughter is a huge catalyst. She was a main reason why I, I started. Uh, really working hard to figure out okay what's going on for me and, and making this journey and then when I connected with Lisa and we started writing it was like wow this is like the the cherry on top this is the the what I've been like waiting for and dreaming of something like this to happen and and it's just opened up this whole world for me and um and I can't think Lisa enough and 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 just uh because it's really been um it's it's been such a like a motivator in my life like knowing that this is happening but um it's not like it it's not like I've uh, have those uh, thoughts or worries of failing or letting someone down but I just I'm so excited about what's happening that it keeps you uh, just keeps me going, right? There's purpose in this, uh, and uh, and also the response uh, that's happened since we started filming um, has just been amazing. And and Randall and and the other cast and Jonathan and and everyone um, so open and and uh, you know open hearts and arms for just for for me and and my journey and stuff and everything that I've been through and no judgment or. Um, yeah, which is amazing. I think I speak for Kirk and Greg when I think we can hands down, uh, like affirm that like mission accomplished with the story, mission accomplished with everything. Like I, I think it's it's just it's beautiful. Uh, I wish I I wish I had more eloquent things to say other than uh, it, it it was absolutely beautifully done and the story and the live is beautiful. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, capturing somebody's soul like that is very difficult, and it, and I feel like it's there. I really do. It helps that Joey's so open and vulnerable um, when he's speaking. But I was like, how, how could this guy have robbed a bank? He's like the nicest guy who. That's what I think ever every day. A bank. Like that. I, I mean, if if I was working at the bank and you tried to, rob, I'd be like, okay, yeah, you know. Was it a polite yeah. bank robbing? Can you please put the money in the bag? <laughs> it was. <laughs> It, it it was I, I although it's still I, you know I look at it and uh, and I look back and I saw some interviews with the the poor woman um, and it changed her life she moved away from from that town that city and and I uh, can never take that back and and because um, uh, you never know if someone's is if some even though I was like, please just give me the money, like just, and I'll get out of here or whatever. Uh, it, you never know if someone's that desperate to, to do that. How, how, what, uh, how desperate are they? Right. How far could they go kind of thing? So I understand the fear on the other end and yeah. that's something that I never, um, never intended or wanted. And uh, honestly, never, it never occurred to me. And I feel horrible for that because I figured, oh, if I'm just passing a note, 
if I'm just, if I'm, I don't, I don't have weapons, I'm nonviolent. <clears throat> it, it shouldn't be a big deal. It'll just, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, the other person doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I was going to, I was going to say that like in, in the making of the documentary, it's like the trust you have to have Joey too and Lisa to do it. You're telling your story, you're open and you're giving her this. And you, as you know, stories can be told in edits. Um, I don't, you know, obviously formed the relationship, but I think that in itself is probably what makes it so impactful is that there's a trust between you two. And that's another one of those things that just comes through, um, you know, in the film, not that there's, you know, interaction between Lisa and Joey in it, but it's like that dynamic is a real dynamic that impacts the final product. I think that's very evident in, in the movie is the, the trust. Like you can see, considering how emotionally available Joey is in like in this documentary, I think it just shows you like, like the environment provided by Lisa and like just everything, there must've been so much trust on set. And like, that's, that's just something that you, you would die for these days. So I, I commendable. Absolutely. It was I mean, pretty, we, pretty oh, sorry. No, no, go, go for it. I, th I think it helped that, you know, we connected first through letters and that to me, our first mutual love of handwriting notes, I think was, you know, I love letters. I love getting mail. I love, I think it's a lost art. I do it when I can. So that even that initial connection, we were kind of on the same page. Excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> and, and so from then, like to, for, to be able to send a camera, like as soon as he's just walked out of jail and go, here's a camera, can you just like start self-shooting stuff? Um, I don't know, Joey, if it was kind of a way that was like cathartic for you to be kind of talking about it. But, you know, that interview that we did where you're so emotional with your NASA, I think that was the first interview like we ever did on like day two of meeting um, and I was kind of prepared to, you know, it'll be like, I'll talk about the film first and then we'll get a little bit more and get, but I, I don't know if it was just all bottled up and you were kind of ready to share your story, but I think it did help that we had that connection through letters to start with, but I was really surprised how open you were. And it just felt like all those emotions were on the surface, ready to, to come out and talk about. They, they were. I mean, I, I definitely feel like we connected and really understood um, <clears throat> that if we were going to do this, it was going to be done right. And it was going to be done with heart and, and care, um, uh, you know, as much heart as the movie had. Right. And, and all that, just that real um, genuine feeling. And um, yeah, I think in and then once we met, when when you sent me the the video camera, I remember I was uh, uh, it was that was actually hard because it was something where when we're sitting here and and you you know someone asked me a question, I can respond to it. Uh, opening up on just a level of like, oh, what do I want to talk about? What do I want to share? Um, sometimes that's that's a challenge and especially at that point i was still pretty vul fragile i think is is the word even when i was just released there and and uh i had done a lot of work i had done you know a, a tremendous amount in the in the, the therapeutic community that i was at um but i also after i was released i did another eight months in the program in the community so i even um added on to that and uh and I think I was just ready to to really let a lot of it go. I'd done the work and let and let go of a lot of things and kind of um but sharing it in a completely open way i th I remember saying, I'm like, well, how much do you want to know, <laughs> I know. that interview was four <laughs> hours <laughs> yeah because um and and what's interesting is we we talked about this as well is that i I see the saw the the edits of the documentary and i'm like oh well, okay like it's it really only scratches the surface of of the you know of what i've been through and stuff but at the same time shows shows it in such a um you know in a way that people can relate to and and in a really just a perfect way it was uh i'm i I can't think of the words either, Devin. I just, I, I get, I get kind of speechless when I think about about um, this project and just what we've what we've come through and 
and even seeing the videos for me when I was first released and then to, to who I am today over the past yeah. couple of years, um, it's also like night and day. And I was like, oh my God, is that me? Like, well, that's one, that was one of the hardest things actually in the edit process is because you're trying to do a film that's still taking into account, you know, a, a good duration to keep people's attention. You know, 90 minutes is a good thing for a film. Then you want the making of, and then you want to do enough justice for the story to get the message across. So, I mean, it was, yeah, it was a four hour interview. And so there was a lot in your life that, I didn't include, but it was like, mm -hmm. what are the key points and the key milestones and the key events that happened? And let's follow those. I mean, An it was really- amazing job you did on, on finding that thread and putting it together, really. It was, uh, I, yeah, because going with, for so much information and then finding the essence of, of, uh, of my story, like I just, I put it in your hands. And, and he, he hasn't seen the whole thing either, right? He, he hasn't. You've, there were a couple, he actually, to be, to be fair to, to Joe, there were a couple of things that are in this final edit that were um, his idea. He watched the previous edit. He was like, I'd really like to do a piece that sums this up. And I'd really like to do a piece that sums this up. And I think it works brilliantly. So he's aware of what is in there. He just hasn't seen the finished like version with the opening titles and there's a couple of more clips oh, he hasn't the seen the opening titles the opening no. titles are great <laughs> they're cool huh i mean i don't want to i don't want to make it seem like if you see anything about this movie please see the opening titles but like i loved the opening titles they were so great like we uh, were yeah. really lucky we have a very dear friend um called bob lindemeyer who did the opening titles he did the blu-ray art cover art he did the whole collector's booklet art. He's incredibly talented. He designed the poster. Um, I, I just love the opening titles. Yeah. Hopefully you can see like all the nods to the flight of the navigator and the documentary in the titles as well. Yeah. So I was pretty I, excited. I, I, I was biased going into this documentary, but like literally in the second minute when these, this title sequence comes on, I was like, this is going to be a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I was so, <laughs> so glad. I know it was hard. I was like, I feel bad that I haven't sent the link to Joe, but I was like, I really want <laughs> to to have this kind of mini premiere experience because you're kind of robbed of it. You know, we were going to do festivals this year, and the ones we were going to go in were cancelled, oh, and yeah. so we haven't had that kind of celebration of what you would normally have with fans. Or so we're going to do some screenings of this next year somehow for fans or however we can do it so we can be on the big screen and yeah. um you know we can watch it with other people as apart from over um instead of over zoom but yeah it's been interesting for sure when it needs to be celebrated and there's there's so many years obviously put into this and the story that you're telling um it i i do want to talk about celebrating both your film and the fight of the navigator as well and i know that devin and greg here um uh, probably since childhood, I've had a number of questions that uh, <laughs> <laughs> if Joey can't answer them, then uh, Lisa definitely can. I'm always so. the guy that's like, f that spends like $75 at a Comic-Con to like ask one question to like Alan Tudyk about his role in like Star Wars Rogue One being like, what was it like being a droid? And it's like, there goes $75, but like- You're like I, the one, the ones in Galaxy Quest where they yeah, come up and they're like in episode yeah. six at three minutes in, is that, you know, and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm absolutely, I'm, uh, what, what's, Joey, you did, you did the reading of Galaxy Quest last night. What's that guy's, uh, that act, character's name or the- yeah. it was Justin Long, Jason Nesmith, uh, the 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 super fan oh, from Galaxy Quest. Oh right, Quest. yeah, uh, Brandon. Brandon, right. that's right. Yeah. I'm definitely, I'm definitely a Brandon. Yeah, <laughs> hands down. I wish I, I wish I had more like technical knowledge, but uh, we we definitely had a lot of fun digging into the the fun aspects of like NASA during the '80s and the fun Star Trek doors that you had. Here's the, here's the first segue question: Like, do did the Star Trek doors were they functional? Which when you were being held captive by NASA and you had that you had doors that like slammed oh, shut on you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Were they like, was it like, was it a PA standing behind the door just swinging it shut violently or were like they functionally? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. I know that it slid shut. Like it was a real, um, I'm not sure if it was functional. 
I just, I would have loved it if it was like, oh yeah, that was Bob. Like Bob was the guy in charge of all the doors and he was great, you know. <laughs> Best door man around. Well, that, yeah, that, that was a full set. So it was, it was basically built. It wasn't like they, we used an actual building uh, for those rooms. But um, uh, yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, I think it probably was Bob. It would have been. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I, it probably, uh, and if you don't know, it means that whoever it was if they were bobs they were doing their job correctly and they didn't get fired it's like all right bob you have one job and it's to close this door close it quickly and don't be seen by joey so he yeah. obviously did his job it's not the guy with the hydraulic lift who shut it on harrison ford yeah, in yeah. force awakens right <laughs> they had to stop production i am i only recently learned a fact that i wish i had known no one told me when we were making the documentary and i don't know if you know this joe but jonathan sanger said this at the egyptian theater that um, you were supposed to actually shoot at NASA, but it was the day that the Challenger explosion oh, right. happened. And so they ended up going to, I think, like a power plan or a sewage treatment plan or something and just putting NASA signs on it. And I, I think I only learned that like last week. <laughs> but that was, I thought, was pretty cool that, you know, that was quite a big change in location. That's right. I didn't, I remember hearing that... Uh, about that but uh only recently that's uh that's that's actually the the answer to one of my questions that i have written down was what's a fun fact imdb trivia that maybe you've never mentioned before or are allowed to mention about fly the navigator that's is that that's, on imdb no i i can oh. that's that was my goal really out of this whole thing was not to celebrate <laughs> like the the emotional availability of joey and to celebrate this great documentary was to find a true new imdb trivia for flight of the navigator that was really my goal no that's that's well, absolutely a lie there but it is there uh, it is there it is it, it, it's it's interesting that uh, it's the only film i can think of where nasa the nasa guys are the bad guys <laughs> it's like a strange setup they have guns i don't know yeah what's the Na on. nasa's got guns they're holding people against their will <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting i could understand if let's say this happened in real life and someone went missing for 12 years and they came back and they hadn't aged of course people would want to ask questions and they would want to get the answers and i have to assume though the person who was missing and the people surrounding that would also want to get the answers as long as nasa wasn't holding them against their will if there was an agreement it's like hey yeah let's work together we'll figure this out because this is weird but yeah, that set up. Like when you said, it's like, oh, that was a, a set, a fully built set. We didn't shoot actually you know, on a NASA campus. And I thought, yeah, that would have been interesting if you did. And they actually had a, a holding cell. Granted, it was a nice room with toys in it. But it's like, oh, yeah, we've got these holding cells for people here. Well, to add to the animosity, they put him in a room. They strapped him down to like a chair. And they made him watch their findings. So they put like <laughs> they put these things on his head. <laughs> and they make him watch whatever they find. Like that also is like kind of like sadistic for NASA to be like, like, okay, we need to find out the truth of where you have been for these eight years, but also we're, we want you to watch. We want you to see yeah. what's going on inside your okay, noggin. Next question. Next right. question. Yeah. <laughs> like, Wait, who's putting that on the screen? It's like, yeah. <laughs> come on, we need the info. We need the intel. Yeah, there's the, some, there's some... the professionalism there isn't at the highest degree yeah. because, <laughs> they, you know, they have a, a scared child with them and they're going, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, like basically like shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you well, know, you've also like, got you've got Sarah Mich you've you've got uh, you've you've got uh, what's what's her name? Purple Sarah, hair. Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker, who works at NASA, who went to a concert and then the next day just goes to her shift and she's got purple hair. So I mean, speaking of professionalism, I mean you you got to cover that up or put a NASA cap on or something. Come on. <laughs> I, I would assume this is I what happens assume, when you yeah, watch the movie. So, they're they're so they're, it's like you know, Casual Friday. It must be Casual Friday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, so she's allowed to have the purple hair, but it has to be out by Monday. And and uh, yeah. And meanwhile, after the release of Flight of the Navigator, NASA sees Flight of the Navigator and how it's depicted. And I'm assuming they sent out memos overnight, being like, "Okay, all the NASA guards, we can't have guns anymore. You can't come into work with purple hair." Like, okay, and we got to get rid of the Star Trek doors. I'm sorry, Bob. Yeah. I do wonder about that. If you work for NASA at that point, and then that movie was released, and then like, hey, that's not how we are. We're nothing like this. The level of uh, armament amongst the, the employees is something that but, I watched when watching at a later date. Was like, there's Whoa. not really much security, though, when David escapes. 
It's like nope. they have security everywhere. And then it's like, well, let's just have this robot open the door and no one's really checking. And then he just hangs out. And I mean, it's and almost too easy. How yeah, he escapes. You, you, you've got the guard with the dog who's the, the dog's job is to smell things out and point them out to the guard. And the dog does his job <laughs> and, and sniffs and barks oh, at, at Ralph. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you your own breakfast. And it's like, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what's interesting? Okay, may, I'm not sure if people know this, but when Ralph originally pulls up to the door, you can see there was a scene where the security guards outside almost catch me. Oh, that's definitely, I would, right? I would have loved to have seen that scene. Kind of, you kind of see, if you, if you slow that down, you can see that there's a point where there's a guard walking by a door. and it, So what happens is Ralph pulls up um, they're like, oh, he's going in here, but then the door pops open, and and I'm sitting inside, and I'm like, oh, and it, and the guy's coming around to close it, but then I figure out the button, and it closes, right? And they're like, oh, these <laughs> things, these things malfunction all the time, and you know, kind of kick it, just get it in there, right? Yeah, in um, true in true NASA there, fashion. There was, there was that kind of more security outside the door, two more armed guards that I had to get through. But it just didn't. Uh, it didn't pan out. There was something with the, something with the Star Trek door. Uh, or um, the missing scene where where <laughs> David has to like put on a lab coat and pretend to be just like the youngest <laughs> Doogie Doogie Hauser NASA doctor, just being like, just another Friday, boys, just going to check out the spaceship. I'm yep. yeah, I, I have a th I have a thyroid problem. <laughs> uh, here's my here's my next question. Um, uh, given Hollywood's record of recycling and remaking scripts and movies, if and when Flight of the Navigator is remade, uh, Joey, would you take a role? And is there any role that you would like to play? And uh, also, a side note, do you have any favorite actors that you would like to see in the remake? Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to make a Flight of the Navigator too. Are you really? I'm going to do it. I've you know, got, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission. I met this wonderful uh, other friend of Lisa and Ash's, uh, writer guy, and he kind of motivated me to. I have had an idea for a sequel where I'm still David, but I'm an adult now. And I've grown up. And I mean, I don't want to give away too much of it, but uh, <laughs> I've grown up, and there's this element where I've, uh, you know, been secretly building a spaceship, and my daughter. Uh, stumbles upon it and goes on an adventure. And uh, I thought it would be cool to maybe uh, have like Sarah Silverman as the voice of, of, the, of the eye, right? So, I love it. Like that. She's super, because it's gonna, I wanted it to be a female and protagonist, a, little, a daughter and, and stuff and just have the, that fun. And, and um, yeah, so I actually have some really cool ideas and I would love to be a part of it. And I think it would be something that would be so cool to just to do again because for the love of it for the fans of it not to make millions of dollars but to do it do it justice and to make it a wonderful uh thing because i think it would be really fun and the, and the ideas that we've been throwing around uh would be really fun so it's we'll a, see that's a good place to start that's a great place to start um yeah. well how about how about Lisa, let's say they re remade it or Joey's movie goes through. Uh, would you like to play any characters in it? Let, uh, like, you know, throw yourself in, in the pile, maybe like a, a NASA guard or, or you know. I'd, so. I'd like to be some kind of extra. That would, okay. I, that would probably be the maximum that I would be able to handle. I would just be like in the background, kind of a walk on, but you maybe don't really see my face but i could but still big enough that i could end up doing like comic cons in like 20 years that could be my <laughs> thing <laughs> that's you know and i'll have all my photos of that one still frame where i'm like that's me in the background yeah. you know? this is guy fleegman of navigator 2 yeah, exactly that's no i mean I, I of course it it's always interesting talking about sequels because you know we have these films that we hold so dear and it doesn't have a sequel probably because nothing has been created that does it justice. And, you know, I think part of the reason it's so magical is because it doesn't have sequels, but I think if anyone can do a sequel, it's going to be the navigator himself. So I, as soon as Joe told me all his ideas, I was super excited. Yeah. I got, Especially because it gives me another job <laughs> as a walk on. Oh yeah. Well, it would be, yeah. 
when when they were going to do a reboot, I was approached uh, by Brad Copeland. He was going to do a, a reboot, and he emailed me. and was like, I'd like you to be like a town sheriff or or something. So I thought that would have been fun too, right? Like just just a little cameo, not as David, but just to just to put me in the reboot as uh, as a town sheriff or the doctor. How long ago was that going to happen? Um, I'd have to check, but I I have a feeling it was. 2008-ish or something? I read something in 2009, I think, there was, the idea was being <clears throat> toyed with. So, yeah, yeah somewhere around there. It bounced around, so, but... Uh, I yeah. don't know, you know, it's it holds up. A sequel would probably be better because the original is still easily accessible. Like, it, it's great. Well, it's so. neat that you had never seen it and now can watch it as an adult and it's still, and it uh, and it holds up. I, I and I think one of the tests too is kids, right? Because uh, they the, the kid, they don't let anything get past them. And um, last year I did a uh, we showed it to a class of young actors. So the studio, the acting studio that I've been taking classes with up here, Spotlight Academy, and they have a, a young person's class. And so we did this thing where they showed the movie to the kids. And then I came on after and was like, hey, oh, this is the star of the movie, but he's grown up now. And so they got to ask me cool questions about the film, right? And then the parents got to ask me questions about the trials or the ups and downs or pros and cons of being a child actor and stuff. So it was really beneficial on all fronts. But they were like, I sat in the back and just watched them watch it, you know, and the kids like, right. And, and they're getting up on their chairs and they're like, right. And they're... And, and they're doing all that kid stuff, right? When they're watching, you know, get up on their knees, but they're still keeping their face on the screen so they can watch it. It was so much fun. And they, you know, laughed in the parts and were like, oh, and reacted. It was, And so that was, I, I mean, I thought that was just brilliant. Yeah. Have you, and I don't think I've ever asked you this, have you shown your daughter the film? No, I haven't. I'm going to wait a couple of years. She's six and a half. Uh, she's still pretty frozen. She's she's all about Frozen uh, and Dora, right? So, <laughs> but when so, you show, you should almost like show it to her without telling her that it's you. Yeah, and maybe even for like a good ten years, don't acknowledge that it's you, and then it'll be a really <laughs> nice surprise on like her sixteenth we'll birthday. We'll see. Yeah, I you was, should. I was the Easter Bunny a couple of years ago in the, in the mall. I was a mascot Easter Bunny, and <laughs> she came to visit me. And so there's a picture of us. But she doesn't know it's me. And so 10 years from now, and be like, hey, remember you visited the Easter Bunny? I'm like, that's me. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, and, and honestly, just watching this uh, for the first time, the, the reason the movie holds up, and not just because I'm talking to you, it's because of you. I, I mean, your performance as a child actor is astonishing. The whole movie works because of your performance and your reaction to everything your reaction to Sarah Jessica Parker, for, uh, to your parents. Like, you're actually, as a child, uh, dominating the entire movie. Um, and, uh, like, even, like, your reactions with your parents and the time difference, it's, it really, it really is incredible. Um, and, and very, I immediately, as soon as I finished watching it, I had to look you up because I was like, well, this guy clearly was, had to have been in, like, another 50 movies after this because Haley Joel Osment, you know, was the <laughs> other child that I saw that was this good. Like, it, it's, it's... Well, even the, the acting with Max, which in essence, yeah. I'm going to call a puppet at that point. Yeah. How, how, how did that play out, those scenes? Was there someone voicing it off camera? Yeah, there was. Uh, Tony Urbano, he was the puppeteer, and, uh, and he read all the lines with me. And, and we... We clicked. We had it. Um, you know, my mom remembers it a little more specifically than I do, but I I remember having it. Yeah, I, I he he was my max, and so that's what made it easy uh, easy to do was because we had a, a rep and a, and a relationship, and uh, so and it made it really easy. But um, yeah, I I mean, I don't. It's it's actually surprising. I can because I can watch the movie and I don't see myself. I see David going through this this thing, right? And uh, and it's something where I go, 
you know, now that I'm getting back into acting and was like, oh, was I just a child actor who fit the part or can I actually, um, do I have the chops? Can I pull, can I pull this off? And I'm, I'm, I really think that I am. So it's, it's not too late to get those 50 movies in. <laughs> we'll see. So I'm uh, watch them. You're, 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 watch them. you're still, uh, you're plugging away. You're, you're still doing it too, which is great. Mentioning um, you're still taking acting classes and then um, ha obviously uh, having watched uh, uh, the documentary and following up it seems like you're still even amidst the pandemic you're you're still doing like readings and uh got to see you do the reading of galaxy quest last night and then i also read or heard that you did the reading of flight of the navigator and you got to play max and I, i'm i'm curious what was your experience like on the flip side it was fun i kind of uh i wasn't sure whether to imitate yeah peewee's you know <laughs> voice uh because i can do it pretty well uh but uh right well see you later navigator do <laughs> 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 all be tight special sauce on a cheese pickle bunny you don't accept me see bun don't forget to feed bruiser <laughs> so, right? but uh i wasn't sure whether to uh, <laughs> to imitate or to try and create my own voice and i think i did a little bit of both uh it was fun the, the interesting thing was that the script, the screenplay was different than the movie ended up being. There's a whole whole other element. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a young Carolyn in the end. There's the, the masters of uh, who are, you know, going to destroy Max with the, with the countdown clock and stuff. And Oh. Yeah, there's a whole, whole other element. You can watch that on Scripts Gone Wild if you I want. I think I will. Uh, yeah, and it, and it has the whole the whole other ending to the film that we shot a bunch of that as well and um but it just it didn't uh, play play out so they switched it up and i do want to point out um anybody who listened to the last episode that i called uh the alternate sarah jessica parker ending um that, that i could feel the movie was moving that direction just want to Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I knew it too. Like when 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 I saw that in the documentary, like I immediately was removed from the documentary because I'm like, well, I'm sure Kirk is gonna feel great about the fact that he called <laughs> that moment that Sarah Jessica Parker was going to be a younger. There was gonna be a younger version, uh, but yeah, no, I think I think if it, it like we we had um we had kind of predicted that if they did a remake, that that would have been. Uh, a very clutch way to to end it where it's like sarah jessica parker she's young and of perfect age for now young david to date yeah well that's what i thought would be cool for the sequel is that david ends up growing up meeting carolyn working at nasa they get uh, married, have the kid you know right so bring carolyn back into the mix because the, the timing would be right because you know uh yeah, and David gets all smart because he's figured out how to harness this info from his brain. So he works for NASA, and there's this whole there's all sorts of cool stuff you no, can that do. That makes with. that makes much more sense. We were we went down the rabbit hole that is David's going to become a music producer because he was he was thrust upon oh. the, <laughs> the music of the '80s, and he he had the foreknowledge about like you know all, all the great '80s bands, and so he's brought back as a child, and he's like, I'm going to be a music producer. But it makes much more sense. You have all of this. NASA knowledge you have advanced technology in your brain that would that would make more sense that you would do that yeah <laughs> Greg, uh, I see I see you're nodding your head uh, in agreement here is there anything that you wanted to ask or explore no I think we covered most of the things uh running through it I like I mean I know that this comes up constantly but it's referenced in the documentary but the steps I'm sure that everyone who talks about the movie talks about the steps the floating steps <laughs> to the spaceship and obviously it's just an optical trick and the angle that they shoot it but it's still it's like wow it's really they you know and again this is in the documentary just some of the things with the models and the perspectives of shooting and things are done in camera and not in post and you know there's a lot of cool stuff tied to that movie uh and and just the design of the ship I brought this up in the other show but you know what is it when it uh, changes shape? It's the the maneuver phase. First class well, to third class. Oh, yeah, first class. 
when I was a kid, I would hang my uh, fist out the, the car if I was driving with my dad. And I would have my hand change shape into like the faster chip. <laughs> <laughs> and so it would just cut through the air. It's like, this is, this was it. This existed in my brain for quite a long time. Again, I said that this movie had an impact and it did so much so that I would just put my hand out and pretend that it was uh, the Mac ship. But they're the kind of things that if a sequel happened, like yes, Flight of the Navigator was really great with that technology with the ship, but you know, it's magical because things were physical. And mm -hmm. I think also in the performance, when you have Joey acting against physical things, it, you know, it really helps as a kid, but you would have to, to a sequel have the puppets and the in-camera effects yeah. and all of that magic that makes it, well, films of the eighties, I think so memorable. So remember that, Joey. So yeah, yeah. There's going to be producers that are going to like push you around for like, oh, we've got this great digital alien that we're going to do, yep. and he's, nope. he's going to he's going to bite your he's going to bite your daughter's hat off, and then you get you you can do the belch sound, but you know we want the digital we want the digital alien. Yeah. You push push for live. Yeah, she's acting against a green hand that yeah. just comes in and <laughs> takes it away. <laughs> And you're gonna have to figure out what happened to that Puck Marin, right? Like, what happened to that thing? Did it? Oh yeah, it's got a plan for him too. I hope so, because uh, you know, you think about like, what is it that they introduce a foreign species into a civilization? <laughs> maybe it's a girl. Maybe it's pregnant. Maybe uh, it grows. Maybe that was a baby one. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Predict predicting the average lifespan of a puck marin right now are we saying that like a puck marin can grow up to be you know 30 years old and there then... he is <laughs> yeah, so the puck marin an infant is like you know what eight inches but when it's an adult it's like six feet so um... <laughs> so for you like there you great. go yeah yeah it grows up and it's like taller than everyone else and yeah, you no, and, and david has to hide him Maybe yeah. nitrogen. Nitrogen causes it to grow even bigger. And since <laughs> nitrogen is the most abundant gas in our atmosphere. It's things you can't even think of. And it has this oh, reaction. Man. It grows to 30 feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's the whole element that, da that uh, Jeff, young Jeff, has seen the Puckmarin too. So I got to include him somehow. He's got to. Yeah, there's like a whole, there's a whole spinoff Disney series waiting to happen. And it's literally centered around the two boys hiding the fact that they have an alien <laughs> from the world. Like I would see that like a 10 episode Disney original TV show. And it's just David, David and his brother, Jeff, and they're just hiding, they're hiding an alien. That's it. Right. Yeah. And then Max occasionally shows up. Called the Puck Marin. And like then, how? You got the Mandalorian and the Puck Marin. It just writes itself. And then you can have a crossover episode of like Baby Yoda and Baby yeah. Puck Marin go on their journey. <laughs> Sold. Whoever this listens whole, to this, invest. This whole <laughs> recording, worth it for many reasons, but this is it. Now we've got an idea we can capitalize on. That's what uh, this is all about. Well, we've got we've got five separate people recording this episode, so it's just <laughs> up to all of us to send it to the appropriate people after this. So there you go. <laughs> Anything else before we? Uh... Uh, yes, last question, and this is goes for everybody. Uh, what is your one, at least one of your favorite childhood movies that you feel influenced you, Lisa? I'm sure you've got seventeen to name, but like I'm gonna make you name one uh that uh, is one of your favorites obviously other than flight of the navigator and or if you can't narrow it down maybe just a, a childhood guilty pleasure movie i straight away i know which one to say and it's probably not one of the mainstream ones but it is also relevant to flight of the navigator is dream a little dream which is i know a bit left field i mean love goonies love labyrinth dark crystal all of them but dream a little dream was so important to my growing up to Corey's fan, I was Corey Hain. Um, but Matt Adler, who was in Flight of the Navigator, was also in Dream of Little Dream. And he, I was so nervous to meet him. I don't think I told you, Joey. I was, he was supposed to come to the reunion, but he couldn't make it and I was gutted. And then the next day we did his interview and I just, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna meet Matt Adler in Dream of Little Dream. <laughs> and I've just, I, I, I bought the t-shirt the other day, I have it somewhere. And it's just, I love it so much. And it was, one of those films that I love because of like, it got me through high school and, you know, not so fun times. And it was just my kind of go-to film for certain parts of growing up. So two Corey's all the way, but that is my ultimate, I think outside of Flight of the Navigator. 
Okay, is that my turn now? Yeah. Okay. Well, right off the bat, I the the two came to my mind, but one is called Bugsy Malone. I don't know if not many people. Have That's seen like it. Ash's favorite film. Yeah, me and Ash really clicked on that. It's Scott Bayo and Jodie Foster. It's this musical, uh, kid gangster movie with whipped cream Tommy guns and pedal cars and and just it's and it's brilliant and the music in it is incredible. The songs are just fabulous. Uh, so I love that. And and then I'm Greece. I watched Greece like over and over and over and I wanted to be John Travolta and uh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah. So I think Eric, we all wanted to be John Travolta. At some yeah, it's point. true. Yeah, I would I would agree. I think that's what we're going to call the title of this episode. We all want to be John Travolta. <laughs> Even I wanted to be John Travolta. Yeah. Hey. I mean, Travolta is the reason I'm an actor. Like, because I remember Look Who's Talking obviously was a big part when I was young. And, and these two guys have heard me say this before. But uh, watching Look Who's Talking and being interested in acting in movies, like, uh, I'm normally interested as a kid. And then when Pulp Fiction came out, like it clicked for me that, oh, this, wait a second. Like this guy is now Vincent Vega. Like that's okay. This acting thing, like what, it, like you can be two completely different people. But I just <laughs> sat through the credits of Pulp Fiction with my mouth hanging open. <laughs> um, but uh, briefly, I mean, I guess I could say, look who's talking, but that sounds like a terrible answer to this question. Um, <laughs> um, probably E.T. E.T. Um, I had the E.T. posters. I had the E.T. everything. And uh, it still holds up. Greg, you're up. We wouldn't have gotten along, Kirk. I liked Mac and me. Awful. <laughs> awful I mean, I did see Mac and me. It was it trash. Just, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I brought this up. It's going to be no surprise to anyone. I brought it up last week. I even mentioned at the beginning of this show, we didn't get into it. Uh, battery's not included. Obviously, there's a theme here. I like things with spaceships. and That is that, a great film. I yeah, loved yeah. that one. And the real impact it had on me, though, was I think it was the first time I wanted to move to New York. Um, even though they lived in the shitty East Village at the time where all the buildings are crumbling and their buildings being knocked down. Still are. Yeah, but it's like a it's a stereotypical New York walk up building with the you know cast of interesting people who live there, and that really appealed to me. And I was like, I want to live in New York, uh, despite the fact that you know there are awful developers looking to kick people out of their homes, and that's still happening too. <laughs> yeah, but, well, it, in actuality, it's like you hate your neighbors now rather than that that movie where it's like all the neighbors are so lovely and I love their stories. In New York, I, it's really just like shut up down there. I had it. The last building I lived in, the building I lived in for seven years was it. Like there was a guy there from 72. For an example, we won't get too deep into it, but one of the guys had been living there since 1972. Uh, the building, there was a building on the street, a courtyard and a back building. And one day I walked out, I lived in the back building. Someone had dumped all these pennies into the courtyard. And Rocco, he's the guy who's been there since 72. He was like digging through all the pennies. And he's like, Rocco, what's going on? He said, there's a lot of good luck here. I came back later, every penny out of hundreds of pennies, maybe thousands, every penny that was on heads had been taken. And only the pennies on tails were left. So there was a building with people like that who had been living there for decades. And, you know, each one had their own quirks and some of them were annoying, but I really loved it. And, uh, you know, outside of the story, and batteries not included, was that. It's like this weird little community. I was like, oh, where can you get something like that? It's like, oh, New York, and the plan was put into motion. Now, here I am living in this spacious apartment where the living room is also the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. <laughs> living the dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I come to visit, I'll just sleep yeah. on the couch. You, gotta, no, you can have the bed. I usually give up the bed to guests, and I sleep on the couch. That's what you do in New York. You take the bed, I'll sleep on the couch. It's fine. All for it. Uh, Devin, your turn. Wrap it up. Um, uh, wrapping it up real quick for me, uh, hands down, Flight of the Navigator was always a part of the big f three for me. I was always a fan of Flight of the Navigator, Explorers, and Space Camp. So I obviously, more reasons to reiterate why I am Brandon from Galaxy Quest. I was so obsessed with all these space movies as a kid. Um, uh, Explorers uh, and Space Camp. And also, we, I know we didn't even ever touch base on it, but the, the score, Alan Silvestri for Flight of the Navigator, oh, hands down, just like, it's one of the reasons that 
Greg and I are as good of friends as we are, is we have bonded over the score to this movie. Uh, and uh, with Explorers, that's also Jerry Goldsmith, and then Space Camp is John Williams. So you've got these magical movies that really shaped us as kids, and part of it is because of the music. So that's for me. Well, I just want to say I'm so, so thrilled to be celebrating both Flight of the Navigator and Life After the Navigator today. Life After the Navigator, I know that it might seem like we're talking about it just because it worked out this way, but honestly, everybody who's listening, hey, I'm the festival director of a film festival for the last eight years. I am recommending, highly, highly recommending you go buy the Blu-ray. It's already out. You can get it uh, with 12-page commemorative booklet, right? And it's 12 actually- 12 pages. Yeah. 12 whole pages and it's got a short film starring Joey included (laughs) and 70 minutes of bonus features. Seven zero. (laughs) So don't be cheap. Don't wait for Amazon support physical media and buy that Blu-ray, the region free Blu-ray because it is well, well worth it. And Lisa did an amazing job, amazing job directing and editing this film. Like, I am so impressed with the editing work even in this. I know what it takes to do that editing Great. films. Yeah, I mean Yeah, Greg- it took about five months to edit. So thank you. That means a lot. And also I have to, you know, Randall is came on board as the executive producer of the documentary and he was hugely helpful. And I did have the incredible and just bizarre pleasure of emailing him a couple of cuts and he would email back. He was like do you, I have a couple of structural notes. Are you interested? And I was like, yes, send them. <laughs> so he was really helpful in a couple of sections, which I think, you know, obviously made a great difference. So it was just an amazing experience to be working with Randall. You know, I used to dress up as Sandy. I get it. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've all been there. <laughs> and uh, Joey, it's an honor to have you here today. I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, these two guys have been playing it cool this whole time. You changed their lives. You did. Um, well, thank you guys. Thank you all so much for having me. I can't express how much, like, I love these things so much. Uh, you know, I, um, it's just, it's such a gift to me to be able to connect with fans, to hear these stories. I, I honestly tell you, it means just as much to me as it does to you to, um, you know, just to hear these stories and how much like I, I, I literally it, we're all gonna cry I feel, yeah, I yeah. Know, it's, so, it's so beautiful and 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 it's so you know it's just and it's so important these days to just remember and to share that that joy and remember we're all just uh yeah and, and, I mean we're connected now it's so cool and so I really appreciate being being on here and chatting with you guys and I hope Everybody out there has had fun listening or watching or, and um, yeah. And if you ever get stuck for an episode, we can come back on and <laughs> just hang out. Oh, <laughs> don't open that. that door. Don't, don't <laughs> open that door. Don't you do that. <laughs> We're going to yeah. do it. It's going to happen. And if you're ever in New York and we uh, ever are able to be together again, please. Um, we run a theater in Midtown and uh, hopefully I'll still have it after all this is over. <laughs> Um, but we would love to meet you. I'll audition for it and come and (laughs) be in a play. (laughs) It's gonna happen. Let's do it. You, you, you're, you're, uh, uh, what is it? What is the expression, Greg? (laughs) You're writing a check you can't cash. I don't know. Oh, right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but Joey, seriously, like, know, um, how well represented you are in this documentary, man. Like, your your soul is out there and you're a beautiful person seriously like know you're loved you're loved by a lot of people uh, and, and it's been an honor to talk to you today thank um, you so, much. Thank so it was a it was a wild episode everybody um yeah. highs and lows and a lot of nostalgia but uh well <laughs> we're the usual rejects podcast check us out online at usualrejects.com um, most of the episodes we're going to do from here on out will be about life of, uh, after the navigator or the flight of the navigator, obviously, because it's working out pretty well for us. Every but, episode. <laughs> every single episode. 
we're going to individually dissect this movie uh, one part at a time, you know, and, and then eventually we can ask Paul Rubens why he didn't uh, go by Paul Rubens in the credits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was fabulous. See you later, Navigator. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, I'm